A very good evening to everyone. I am pleased to welcome you all to the prestigious guest lecture series under the Hourglass Conclave 4.0, organized by Technoanza VJTR. This is Mahita Samant, and I will be your host for the evening. VJTI was established in 1887 and has been upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of our society. Technoanza has always been an important platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously transferred to many torches. Pioneers of diverse fields have graced Technoanza with their presence illuminating more minds to new areas of interest. Hourglass is a stage incorporating young minds of the nation who bear the mantle of bringing about the revolution needed. An ardent desire to enlighten young minds and inoculate impeccable qualities within them has been the very objective of the GLS since its inception. An hour promising revelation of groundbreaking thoughts and promising ideas, we present to you the Hourglass Conclave 4.0. Today is a day that we add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of remarkable dignitaries. And we are sure that the coming hour will instill a new perspective in each one of your lives. Our guest for today is an industrialist, engineer, scientist, and a poet. We are pleased to host the phenomenal Mr. Nadir Godric. Mr. Godric serves as the managing director of Godric Industries and as the chairman of Godric Agrivet. He serves as an independent director on the boards of companies like Godric and Boys. Godrej Consumer Products and other Godrej Group companies. He has previously served as an independent director for firms like Mahindra and Mahindra, Tata Teleservices and Indian Hotel Companies Limited. Sir is an alumnus of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford University and the prestigious Harvard University. He's also an active member of the Indian Chemical Council, the Oil Technologists Association of India, along with being a part of the National Council of Confederation of Indian Industry. In addition to this, the French government has honored him twice over, including with the prestigious, the National Order of the Legion of Honor. Apart from being a stalwart in his field, Mr. Godrich is known for his predilection of poetry and literature. Sir can fluently speak six languages, including French and Russian, and is a renowned author of books like Nadir Godrich the Poet and Life and Other Poems. Sir, you are truly an inspiration to the youth of this country, and we are honored to have you grace us with your presence. Today, Sir will be sharing his outlook on resilience in adversity. At the end of the lecture, we will be having a Q&A session. So you can drop your questions in the live chat below. Thank you, Mahita, for that kind introduction. A crisis is so tough to face. But if you wish to win this life race, you have to face both smooth and rough. Adversity can make you tough. So do not run, but face your fear and operate in a higher gear. When faced with great ambiguity, there can't be perfect clarity. Therefore, until the problem's passed, reaction times must be fast. It should be clearly understood we shouldn't give up on the good in an endless search for perfection, which merely leads to dejection. And therefore, I'll relate a story, a tale of trouble, with some glory. Although 30 years have passed, much knowledge still can be amassed. I had no idea what was in store, 
One year, our loss was 80 crore. We wondered why we had invested in something strange and so untested as making olefins from oil. It hardly seemed worth all that toil. But alcohol was an intermediate, not ethyl, which gives an immediate kick to all those who imbibe it. And for this audience, I describe it as from C12 to C18. And now this change in tech would mean a change in all our strategy. To lead this change was up to me. I did not do it all alone. My team was good, as is well known. The group was there with all its strengths. To help us out, they went great lengths. A merger helped to save our skin. You must survive before you win. We live to fight another day. Step by step, we found the way. The mission was precisely stated, repeatedly delineated. We had to work to make things right on every front we had to fight. Now we had suffered for our sins. But since we stopped the olefins, we had two columns that were idle. Not using them was suicidal. Configuring them for fractionation, we used them for the preparation of much desired single cuts. And when we settle into ruts, such innovation gets us out. And I have not the slightest doubt, our engineers help save the day, the continuous improvement way. With the help of all of them, we started off with TQM. For problem solving, it is great. But all the same, I must state, a bigger benefit is inclusion, a sense of belonging and a fusion of the entire team working as one until every task is done. We learned a lot of useful stuff, but all of that was not enough. We learned to stretch capacity with Bellico's rapacity. We focused on the bottlenecks with grips that could well throttle necks. And month by month, the throughput rose with just an occasional dose of investment in a plant that's new. We kept the number to just a few. We built new plants for fractionation. We started with our sulfonation, the base we told for HLL, the rest to others we could sell. Now HLL served as the bread. The rest was a nutritious spread. Now TPM was a solution. For us, it was a revolution. The plants were up more and more. The costs were going to the floor. Everywhere the throughput rose and we had a healthy dose of cutting costs everywhere. With energy, we took great care. Whatever saving was suggested, we evaluated and invested. From everyone, we always sought good learnings, but the one who taught us the best was Kokyo's Kawai-san, always pushing us to try to make our product somewhat better. And every time we get a letter, we always learn something new. And this is how we always grew. So nothing will help better than a good customer from Japan to keep you always on your toes and teach you everything he knows. And if you have enough endurance, you will have the assurance your quality is of the best for having passed this greatest test. With our experience in soaps, we had already learned the ropes of processing most distillates available at attractive rates. Competitors use processed oil, our R&D with skill and toil, although the task was rather tough, found ways to use the cheaper stuff. All of this was very fine and added to the bottom line. The catalyst was optimized, the throughput was maximized, and per ton costs were minimized, the profits were then supersized. Production wasn't the only story. Now marketing brought us some glory. Flake longer chains were our 40. We found new markets for a sortie. In China, we could sell a lot. We liked the margins that we got in Argentina and Brazil. Our coffers we could slowly fill. Now, in a crisis, we can learn that once we survive, we can turn 
to opportunities always there if only we would bravely dare to seek them in our darkest hour no matter what we could still bar survival and continuous growth by steadily focusing on both and once again we are out of luck a global crisis has now struck the corona virus strikes us all we don't know who is next to fall when will this war be finally won while lockdowns help they are no fun now every policy maker strives to balance livelihoods and lives no livelihoods is such a cost but once any life is lost nothing at all can bring it back so let's keep lockdowns right on track no livelihoods could mean starvation but there's a solution for every nation direct to home food supply a generous ubi is then the way that we can go these measures can soften the blow the fiscal prudes are bound to blush but this is the time for the rest to rush to kings and even further still this is the time to show some will helicopter money can succeed in serving all that are in need if many people are immune we can open up quite soon the vulnerable should isolate the rest can start to pull their weight the immune should be allowed to roam but many still could work from home and if we take a stance that's wise the economy will slowly rise and time will be the saving grace our actions could speed the pace in mumbai in a month or so according to those in the know all the signs seem to show herd immunity could flow and delhi pune are not far behind that is what the models find but in any good estimation for the rest of our great nation the end is somewhat far away but technology can save the day the solutions that one clearly sees are vaccines and therapies while normally all this takes long the global effort is so strong with biotech we can succeed in finding solutions that we need reforms are now the need of the hour and let us hope that those in power get the message straight and true we need to build the economy anew there is a need in every nation to recover from the depredation but progress we also need to see in climate change and in an inequality the crisis is indeed a pain but there is so much to gain at first any major change will appear to be most strange but then we can begin to see a striking opportunity while all of us are badly burned indeed there's much that we have learned work from home is now a breeze and we can now gain a release from travel bills and office rent indeed this time can be spent to reimagine and reinvent a better world a broader tent surely we can aspire to both sustainability as well as growth at first survival must be prized so cash must be prioritized and when we pass survival fear we can start to reengineer no good crisis should go to waste all of us should now make haste to completely redesign our world a new vision should be unfurled our gaping wounds we should suture for a happy healthy future and what should this vision be a world with more equality government business and society all acting synergistically lockdowns are indeed a pain but there are some things we can gain our air is now extremely clean we see the benefits of going green and wildlife now roams on the streets a sprightly monkey sometimes greets me as i wander in my garden to those bereaved i beg their pardon in this darkest hour there is some light and now we have a clear sight of what a different world might be and yet that false dichotomy between growth 
and being green, unfortunately, is often seen. But I, for one, am always loath to see either or, for I want both. It is no longer climate change within a tolerable range, but a climate emergency is what we now clearly see. A crisis is what it's about, with fires, floods, as well as drought. It only serves to prove the point that everything was out of joint. If we must, we will adapt. Prevention, though, would be more apt. There is a cost to adaptation. It's rising fast in every nation, as well as for the world at large. This will be a heavy charge. In fact, we should all conclude prevention would be really shrewd. There are many paths that we can see for achieving carbon neutrality, but the cheapest way is certainly through energy efficiency. Real interest rates are rather low and high returns quickly flow from any energy saving device for business. This is very nice. Not only are returns quite brisk, there's also very little risk. In India, mandated CSR can help us go very far. Multiple benefits is what one sees with water projects or growing trees. Good livelihoods are created, our carbon emissions are abated, trees planted at a river source maintain the flow throughout its course. So many benefits we can see. The preservation of biodiversity. Different species can be tried. Useful products can be supplied, like biomass or edible fruits. And yet, the trunk and the roots can sequester carbon, clean the air, a win-win that is very fair. So while we decarbonize, why not also monetize? So never fall for either or. Our hearts and minds demand much more. And I myself am very keen that all of us become more green. A serious problem that we see is increasing inequality. Artificial intelligence and automation will further change this equation. While returns to labor steadily fall, returns to capital rise very tall. Though analyzed well by Piketty, his prescription though is rickety. All of us should understand good spending on education as well as on our people's health helps to distribute our wealth. High spending leads to deficits, gives rating agencies the fix. And Piketty makes a simple pitch. Let's go out and tax the rich. Alas, exorbitant taxation is often the ruin of any nation. If you want the economy to grow, high taxation is a no-no. Is there a different way to play? And could we find a better way? Now, interest rates are rather low, but equity can rapidly grow. A sovereign fund can earn a lot, much benefit can then be caught because there is some synergy. Low corporate tax inevitably will grow the fund at a faster rate, nor do we have to wait and wait for social spending can proceed. It is an urgent need indeed. Most nations need to start from scratch, but India's halfway through the match. We have a fund, the public sector. Now, please don't think I want to hector. If good returns is what we are seeking, then this portfolio needs some tweaking. The deficit could safely rise with social spending the worthy price. This would be no reckless act, but a prudent social pact. Prudential norms would still be there with a change that's very fair. The change I feel that we should see is replacing debt to GDP with debt to assets, as we see in a well-managed company. Inclusive growth is a must. Everyone must win our trust. A sovereign fund can provide social spending and should be tried. But some economists who care 
think that businesses should share their profits with the working classes within the firm or for the masses. But how could this be achieved? How will this idea be received by businesses that stand to lose? Can they be incentivized to choose to give away a certain share? Would a capitalist ever dare? The government could pave the way. For argument's sake, let's just say that lower taxes would apply to a company that does supply a given fraction of its shares to a fund, which then cares for all workers as a group. We'd see a beneficial loop. This voluntary sacrifice could prove to be very nice. Free shares, of course, are a loss, but there's no reason to be cross. The tax concession can compensate. The net result would then be great. In time, workers would get to spend their newly earned dividend. The loss of tax would be a pain for government, but they would gain from taxes from the workers' spend. So all would gain in the end, and businesses then would be prized, well valued, and legitimized. The going now is very tough. Just survival's not enough. New crises will come our way. They could come on any day. All of them we can't foresee. But climate change, inequality, increasing authoritarianism, as well as the ever-growing schism between strengths and rationalism, two worldviews through a different prism. Now is the time for us to dare. Relentlessly, we should prepare to avert these crises yet to come. Though we are in pain, we can't be numb. At first, of course, we must survive then find the wherewithal to thrive in a newly transformed world that we've collectively unfurled. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your exhilarating and truly mesmerizing words. I am sure that the audience is startled and astonished uh, about how beautifully you put in so many things in such short time. Um, before we conclude, um, there are a few questions that we would like to ask. Sure. So the first question is, um, how did you develop a fondness for poetry and from where do you derive your inspiration to write? Right. Uh, my love for poetry came from my grandmother, who was a poet and who wrote for uh, the Indian independence movement in magazines such as Swaraj. And uh, she was an English literature major, uh, one of the early women in India to go to college. When she went to college, there were nine girls in the entire college. <laughs> and from her, I got the inspiration. She would re recite poetry loudly. And so the sounds of poetry were always in my mind, but I started writing only in the 1980s. And then I started making speeches in verse. And my speeches in verse were quite popular. So I thought, why not make most of my speeches in verse? Definitely, so your speeches are truly wonderful. Um, so the next question is that how important is it for companies to take up green business strategies or to develop a more sustainable business model? It is extremely important for all of us to take climate change very seriously. And as I mentioned in my poem, the cost of adaptation is higher than the cost of prevention. The trouble is the cost of adaptation is borne by everybody. Uh, the cost of not doing anything uh, enables, helps the individual, but hurts society. So some kind of carbon price would help businesses to get the message. Uh, and it would be nice if there was a global carbon price, even a global carbon tax. If you have a global carbon tax of about $60 per ton of carbon emissions, 
you would stop carbon emissions. It would be very easy for businesses to become neutral. And although the cost of that is pretty high, you must remember it is 3% of world GDP and 10% of world taxation. So theoretically, you could have this tax and rebate some other tax. So the net cost to the economy could be zero and climate change could be solved. But failing that, we have to have other ways of doing things. In India, we have indirect carbon pricing. You know, we pay a very high price for petrol and diesel. Our electricity rates are exorbitantly high. We often in business pay seven to eight rupees, households pay 11 to 12 rupees, and yet we can source green energy at three rupees per kilowatt hour. And many businesses actually find it economical to buy uh, green energy cheaper. So all this encourages, and then as I mentioned in my poem, CSR can be used to provide multiple benefits to people as well as to the environment at the same time. Therefore, in India, we can achieve carbon neutrality by pursuing all these methods. But globally, it would be very difficult without a carbon price. That is truly a very refreshing perspective on combating climate change. So the next question that we have is, how do you think that this pandemic will shape our near future in terms of businesses and personal life? Yes. There will be a lot of business changes. Uh, offices will change a lot. Some companies have already announced that they won't have offices. At best, they'll have monthly meetings. Other companies have decided that for security reasons, etc., they need uh, office workers in one place. But they may need to have more social distancing until the pandemic goes away. And those companies may even require more space. Then uh, travel will probably become much less until the pandemic is completely solved, which may take a long time. And even when things open up, people may not travel as much. Business travel will be considerably reduced because people have gotten used to video meetings as we have gotten used to video meetings. So all those things will change. Some sectors have benefited. Uh, the stock price of Zoom has shot up. And uh, businesses such as hotels, restaurants have been very badly hit. Some businesses will be reinventing themselves. But I really hope that because of this pandemic, we take climate change and inequality uh, very seriously. And all of us try to work at reducing that because it is in the interests of all of us. With climate change, it is clear that if it continues, it will be a disaster. And with inequality, we may be stoking up huge problems. Besides, I would like to put it this way, that if the poor become more well-off, the middle class also becomes more well-off. It's that not is something to get everybody up. Yes, that is something I put here. That's true optimistic way of looking at this pandemic. Uh, yes, I think uh, in any crisis, you must look at the positives. Uh, and I know it's very easy to get depressed, but that serves absolutely no useful purpose. <laughs> uh, it's understandable they're yes, depressed, sure. especially for very gregarious, outgoing, extrovert people. It's very difficult. But it's important for all of us. Uh, some, of, some of us, like introverts like me, are actually quite happy in times like this. But we all need to reach out to other people. And we have other means of reaching out. So just always reach out to people. Reach out merely to be in touch, merely to get some support. You sh just because of the pandemic doesn't mean you can't socialize. It's physical distancing, not social distancing, although we call it that. Yeah. Surely, sir. Um, and then we have a last question for you. 
and that is what advice could you give to your 18 year old self to my 18 year old self <laughs> i'm sure if i knew everything i knew today i would do things differently but that is an absolutely futile exercise uh, because you can only learn from failure. So it, advising yourself in hindsight not to fail is totally useless. So the only yeah. thing I might advise myself as an 18 year old or any other 18 year old is to do a lot of experimentation always, to not be afraid to fail that doesn't mean that you blindly go and fail. Always, if you do anything new, examine the risks, try to mitigate the risks, but don't let the risks frighten you. Go ahead. Even if you fail, you will learn. In India, unfortunately, uh, we don't appreciate failure. We think failure means the person is a failure. Actually, failure means is your project fails and you learned a lot. And we should have that mentality. Another advice I would give, to, uh, piece of advice I'd give to every 18 year old is to learn as much as possible about everything. You may be specializing in something, but try and keep your knowledge as broad as possible. Because in real life, you need broad knowledge. You, you need to know how to socialize. You need to know how to make friends. You need to know how to impress people. You need to know how to ask for help. All these things are useful for success in life and don't get stuck in a specialty. I'm sure that this piece of advice is what a lot of 18 year olds need to hear right now. Thank you so much for joining. You're most welcome. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm sure that your brilliant advice and your valuable insight into what, what is happening in such times of adversities would create a deep and lasting impact on minds of each and every person watching. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahita. And thanks to Gary. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir.